All right, good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Laura. I'll be leading the session this afternoon. Um, we've done a few quick introductions so far. Um, Elaine has just recently joined us, um, and Catherine. If everyone can just confirm that you can hear me okay, if you just drop us a line into the chat box. Um, and also, if you haven't yet so far, if you could please let us know what school you're from and if you've started taking part in the project yet with your pupils. Um, so it's great to have you all here um, and it's great to see that Calabar, you're enjoying uh, working with the project so far and Tracy, there with her colleague Sheila, hello to you both. Um, great to hear that you're doing work with the whole school, that's fantastic. Um, and uh, we've got a couple others, just type in just now. Great. So, um, as I said, I'm Laura, I'm a Space Ambassador with European uh, Space Education Resource Office, which is based out of the National STEM Centre in New York. Um, I'm here along with my colleague Amy, who is from the Royal Observatory Edinburgh, and Christine Emmett from St Elizabeth's. So I will bring in Amy just now, she would like to come and introduce herself, because you might have heard from her a little bit. So I'll get her to introduce herself now. Just switch. So hi everyone, um, I wish I could say to my support faces in names but I can't see you. <laughs> well at least you can see me and know vaguely who I am now. Um, so as you know I, I took over from half from Jennifer who you might have corresponded with and half from Olivia who's our new public engagement manager who took over from Tanya. Um, so it was all a bit chaotic at the start so hopefully now everything's all settled with the projects and you're all happy to continue and you know you're enjoying it. So should I start now? Um, I've got a couple more books okay. to do. Switch back again. So we're going to do a little bit of musical tears um, this afternoon, so I hope that's okay. Uh, so just to give you an overview of what we're going to cover this afternoon, um, we're going to have a look at uh, basically what Tim's been doing so far, so Amy's going to give us some mission highlights. We're also going to look at what the different schools have been up to, thanks to everyone who's been submitting news stories to our blog. Um, and we're also going to have a little look at how things have been working in school, and this is where we're really keen to hear from you um, about what you've been up to, and that's why also we're joined uh, by Christine from St Elizabeth's to share a bit about her experience, and you can question her as well, I'm sure she'll be delighted. Um, and um, we're going to have a look at a couple of resources as well, but this is also an opportunity for you to us at to, for you to ask us any questions you'd like to do with resources, the project, Tim's mission, that's what we're here to do for you today. So we're hoping this is going to be a nice interactive session. We've got a few things to ask you, so please interact with us um, via the text box. Um, but just to say so far, um, your school is part of a project um, which is running nationwide. There are 500 schools across the UK taking part this year. There'll be another 500 uh, next. There's um, over 50 in Scotland have been taking part in different activities. Um, and we've been doing lots and lots of work along the length and breadth of Scotland where myself, the Royal Observatory and others have been visiting schools and we know that some of you have been organising visits into the, the ROE as well which has been great um, and we're just really delighted with the work that's, that's been going on so far so really hope to highlight some of the things that have been so successful so far and maybe give you some new ideas for the rest of the term and perhaps next year as well. But now we're going to um, kick off um, with Amy's going to return uh, to give us a bit of an idea of the mission overview. All right, Amy. All right, back again. So if I talk too fast and or too scouse, do let me know in the box and Laura will give me a prod just to slow down a bit, make myself a bit more coherent. All right, so in part of my little countdown, um, I've included some actual science research because I was in danger of just doing all the fun stuff <laughs> and none of the more serious experiments. Um, so starting off with ocular health. Now, basically, this is because crew members' bodies obviously change a lot in a microgravity environment. Um, and a lot of them experience some form of impaired vision just because you have a lot of pressure changes going on in your skull and your brain. So what this one does is between March 2013 and sometime in this year, um, you're monitoring the eyes of various astronauts to look for any changes um, because they can also affect, like, say, visual, but also vascular and the central nervous system of the astronauts. Um, and this will also continue when he's back on Earth, as they will do a follow-up study to see how long it takes all these crew members to return to normal with their, with their vision and such. So they'll test things like their contrast sensitivity, so their ability to distinguish between light and dark, um, pupil reflexes, just like when you get your own glasses and your pupils expand and contract, they test for that, um, and also just you know how the muscles are hold, holding up as well. Next one is the airways monitoring experiment. Now there's actually quite a lot of dust particles in the 
atmosphere of the ISS that just get trapped in the circulation system. So this experiment studies the occurrence and indicators of airway inflammation as a result of this. And this uses ultra-sensitive gas analyzers, which as you can see in the picture here, analyzes the exhaled hair of the astronauts. Um, so this will help to highlight any health impacts that might come as a result of this. Um, but it's also useful for more long-term missions to the moon or Mars if they ever happen, hopefully they will. As you know, astronauts have to be more self-sufficient in, in analyzing and self-treating themselves for such conditions that might arise as a result of being up there long term. Um, and this also holds um, like applications on Earth as well for monitoring things like asthma, which is you know an inflammatory sort of airway condition, um, and any other sorts of illnesses to do with your airways as well. So number eight in a little countdown was the teachers in flight call with Tim Peake, which happened just very recently. And I know some of our Tim Peake teachers actually went down to this event in York in the STEM Centre there. So I hope you had a really great time. Um, so basically, this is various primary and secondary school teachers and some students, um, as well as some space scientists and engineers, all got together to talk to Tim Peake live from the ISS, interact with him, ask him a few questions. Um, just why should the kids get all the fun, hey? So again, this happened in York, as I say, um, and it also had some talks from experts during the day and some little activities as well to get everybody involved and active. So some of the questions that the teachers asked included, you know, which skills or experiences have unexpectedly proven most useful to you in space? Um, is the career of an astronaut your passion and what other passions do you have? And hopefully the answer is yes, it is passion. <laughs> um, and also, if you had the opportunity to start your education again, would you have done anything differently? Which I think is an interesting one. I think lots of people ask this to themselves all the time. So I hope, like I say, those who went had a great time can report back to us about that for the blog. So this number, this one, this is number seven, space headaches. Now for this one, um, Tim Peake had actually been in space an hour when they started this experiment. And en route to the ISS inside the Soyuz capsule, he had to fill out a questionnaire just basically monitoring any headaches or sensations of pain in his head he might have experienced during the flight up there. Um, just two pages long, various yes, no questions and a sliding scale just so they can get an idea of what he's experiencing on the way up there. Now, these headaches can be a common complaint during space flight, especially during the first week or so, again, as you adapt to this microgravity environment. Um, so preliminary studies have been done before on astronauts, but this is the first sort of long-term one that has gone on. So Tim's actually coming in sort of halfway through this experiment. 24 astronauts in total are being, you know, answering questionnaires for this. Um, so they fill in this questionnaire every day for the first week and then weekly afterwards. And it's an electronic document once he's on the ISS that just gets sent to the, the scientists who will do the analysis for this and they'll generate some results at the end of it. So the next one is burning fuels in space with the BAS experiment. And BAS stands for burning and suppression of solids. So this examines how to effectively and safely extinguish a variety of fuels should they combust. Um, because with enough ventilation, they can burn just as well as they could on Earth, um, which is obviously very dangerous in such a confined environment. Um, but putting out fires in the same way as you would on Earth might actually make things worse, um, depending on you know, what substances you're using and such. So you also have to take into account things like the geometry of the flame is very important on the ISS um, and also the characteristics of the object or item that you're using to extinguish the flame. So we do need lots of studies on this. Um, and these BAS results will actually contribute to um, designs of fire detection and suppression systems on Earth. So again, these all have applications for landing back on Earth after the time on the ISS. So the next one, getting to the more fun things that might not necessarily have been a <laughs> straight mission is AstroPite, which you might have heard of. So back in early February, there was an opportunity announced for young programmers to send their code up to the ISS to be actually used by Tim Peak. So there were two challenges on offer. The first was to try to convert two Raspberry Pis called Ed and Izzy into MP3 players. So you had to write a code to turn it into an MP3 player. And then the second part was to code actual MP3s to play on the MP3 player. That Tim could literally plug his headphones straight into the Raspberry Pi and listen to music up there. Um, so this closed on March the 31st. Judging took place in Cambridge fairly soon after. 
and entries are received from all over the UK and judged in four different age categories. So the outcome of that is that they pick the winners and four songs will be downloaded onto four MP3 players and will actually be played by Tim in space, which is a pretty good thing to brag to your friends about at the end of the day. So one that you can't have failed to have heard about is rocket seeds. Um, actual seeds of rocket the plant, which <laughs> I only actually found out until recently. Um, so two kilograms of rocket seeds were launched on the Soyuz back in September last year with one of the ESA crews. And Tim Peake took charge of the seeds while they were on the ISS. So they were held there for about six months and then sent back down with astronaut Scott Kelly recently. And now they're being distributed to schools who signed up to the project. Um, and each school receives 100 seeds that have been on the ISS and 100 that remained on Earth. Now, the catch here is that they're not told which packet is which to make it kind of a more exciting, fair test. So you don't give preferential treatment to the space seeds, for example. Um, and they'll know when the national results have been published, which packet was which, the red or the blue. So after the data has been collected, the results are analysed by professional statisticians and as well as leading scientists from the RHS and ESA to draw, um, like interpret the results and draw possible conclusions as to the effect that being in space has had on these seeds. So a fun upcoming one is that Tim is actually running, running the London Marathon at the end of this one. Um, so he will be the first man in space to have done the London Marathon, one of many firsts for Tim Peake, that's for sure. Um, he's running it to raise awareness of the Prince's Trust, which is a very good cause, and will run the whole 26.2 miles on their treadmill that they have as part of their exercise equipment. As you can see in the image there, that's one of um, one of his colleagues. As you can see, he's kind of strapped down by a harness so that don't just float away. Um, and the tension of this harness is what dictates how fast he can run. So I guess they set it to kind of his nominal running pace to make it there. So given how fast the ISS travels, technically, it will only take him six seconds to complete the marathon. Um, but to make it fair, he's actually going to do it sort of 26 miles, you know, as he will be running on the space station. <laughs> so he's hoping to finish it within four hours. But he says that the harness actually gets a bit uncomfortable after only 40 minutes. Um, so that might be a bit of a challenge for him. And his doctors have told him not to go all out because he has to be in peak condition, no pun intended, to return to Earth in the following eight weeks. Um, obviously, running a marathon has got a lot of physical stress on you, as well as space combined the two. You, know, you don't want to push yourself too hard there. So he's got a nice quote that says, the London Marathon is a worldwide event, so let's take it out of this world, which I think is quite nice. And he'll be running with an HD video of the London Marathon track in front of him so he can actually feel like he's really there. And he's got a ground-based team running in the actual marathon on the ground called Team Astronauts. So the Cosmic Classroom, um, I hope many of you took part in this because it was displayed online. Now this took place, or it was broadcast from the World Museum in Liverpool and I was lucky enough to have been working there at the time. So you can see me in the corner grinning in the next to cardboard tip. I wish it was the real thing, but you know, maybe one day. Um, so this took place on the 2nd of February and almost 300 school children travelled from all over the country to meet at the World Museum to experience this for a live Q&A. Um, and more than half a million more watched online as well, which is a fantastic number. Um, it's hosted by this new face who keeps popping up now, Kevin Fong, who worked for NASA for 10 years and who was also on um, Stargazing Live this year as well. So here he answered pre-selected questions from school children um, and demonstrated fun things in space, like he did Simon Says, you know, tried to touch his toes and ended up doing a backflip instead. Um, and then the very famous water ping pong ball. Now we put an effervescent tablet inside a water bubble and was able to push it around on paddles. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, his favourite question for that, he said, was what's your favourite button on the ISS and what does it do? Which I think is a brilliant question. And the answer to that one was um, it was for the airlock for the Soyuz capsule to let the new astronauts in. I forgot to say as well, this Cosmic Classroom is actually available to view online still. So if you Google it, it's got the whole video of the entire event that you can watch. And of course, number one, what else could it be apart from well, bleh, performing his spacewalk even? Um, even though it's cut short, it's still a fantastic achievement. Um, I think the first British man to do a spacewalk, at least one who wasn't associated with NASA. Um, so back on the 15th of January, the two Tims, him and Tim Coffret, ventured out um, and had to walk the equivalent of a 50 metre swimming pool along these rails um, to reach what they had to fix on the side of the space station. 
that doesn't sound like a great distance, but you know, when you've got nothing around you except you know the infinity of space, it must be quite a harrowing experience. Um, so to this, for this, they had to replace what they call a solar shunt, which is basically a box that helps convert the electricity from the solar panels um, outside the space station and send it back to the ISS. But just four hours into the six and a half hour mission, um, they had to abort because Tim Coffer had got water inside his helmet. It looks like his cooling system leaked and he had ended up getting bubbles inside his helmet. And obviously, this actually poses a drowning risk. Um, so they had to abort to make sure that he was very safe. Um, but before that, everything had gone according to plan. Um, they were even ahead of schedule, which is probably quite unusual in such a difficult environment. Um, and hopefully, you never know, you might get another chance to actually perform and complete an entire space walk. And that's it from me. That's the highlights of our mission. So, yeah, if you've got any comments or, you know, any of your favourites, then make a comment in the box below and we'll read them. Okay. All right, so please remember you can ask us questions as we go along. And um, just say a quick hello to Kerry, who has joined us. And Kerry, if you can just let us know which school you're from um, and if you've done work on the project so far or if you're about to get started, that would be great. Um, so I'm going to go on now and talk about Tim's return. So hopefully lots of you were able to watch the actual launch. Um, I see Paul mentioned that uh, Miriam's watched it all together. I was really lucky to be at my old primary school, St Mary's in Lark, um, where we watched uh, the launch as a whole school. It's incredibly exciting. Um, so there is lots of, lots of activities around the country. Um, and oh yeah, a quick question from Catherine. Um, yeah, where you can find these links after the broadcast. Um, what Amy and I will do is we'll send you um, a link to the slides and uh, the links that we've been talking about today. So don't worry, we'll make sure if you can't record the links today, we will send them out to you afterwards. Okay, so um, on launch, um, as you can see from this slide there, uh, Tim launched in a Soyuz rocket, um, and this is the Russian way of getting into space. And the launch uh, vehicle splits into various different stages. And the last one that's there on the right hand side that you can see um, is the final spacecraft, which actually will go into space and the one that docked with the International Space Station. Now, that has uh, been up there with uh, Tim orbiting um, since he arrived in December. And it's the same vehicle that will bring him back down to Earth. And his return date is scheduled for June the 5th, that's a Sunday, and that's when we expect him to come back down to Earth. So it's a shame it's not on a school day, um, but hopefully you can encourage your pupils uh, to have a watch um, and see what happens. Um, so um, one thing I'm really interested in, how long do you think it takes to come back to Earth from the International Space Station? So let's have your answers in the box below. How long do you think it takes for Tim to make his journey back down to Earth? So I see you've got a quick question there um, from Tracy about the seeds. Yes, the seeds are being distributed at the moment as from the Royal Horticultural Society. Christine, who's here with us, got hers yesterday. So they must be getting distributed at the moment. So hopefully you have them very, very um, soon. And yes, um, as Amy points out, they, they came back with the astronauts. So Catherine, yeah, three hours. Dorothy's a bit more, a bit longer, three days. Quite a long time to spend in their spacecraft. Three to four hours. Any more guesses before putting out your measure? Five hours. We're in the right ballpark. It's just under three and a half hours that it takes for Tim to return back to Earth. Um, so the launch as well, um, the actual num the number of hours it took for Tim to get into space was several hours, but it used to take them two days to get into space. So they did used to spend a lot longer getting into space, but now it's much reduced and the return journey is just less than three and a half hours. So what happens is that when Tim returns to Earth, they actually will remove themselves from the International Space Station, so whilst they're in orbit, and they will start to slow down. Now, the actual spacecraft, um, which again you can see here on the far right hand side of the slide, that's actually in three different parts. Right in the middle are the crew quarters, um, which is the, the actual unit that will return to Earth. And the bit that's it's got the solar panels, so the bits that are sitting there either side, that will be jettisoned, um, as will the area in the cone as well. So there's a bit inside that will be the only part that returns back to Earth. So they'll remove themselves from the International Space Station and they'll start to slow down. But at this point, they're still orbiting around the Earth. So they're travelling quite quickly and the main thing they have to do is to slow down. So they have engines that they will fire to help them slow down, but eventually they will remove themselves from that part, they'll lose that part, um, and the engines will be chucked away 
and burn up before they get into the atmosphere. So this happens usually about three hours in, when they've been orbiting the Earth several times, they'll then start to descend uh, back down into the actual uh, atmosphere. Now, um, this is what Tim can look forward to um, in coming back to Earth. And if you have a look there, um, on the left hand side, that's Alexander Gerst. He's a German uh, European Space Agency astronaut, and he's there with two of his Russian colleagues. They're packed fairly close together, aren't they? And hopefully you can see around them, there's all these different packages. Now, they've had to pack the spacecraft for return. They often come back with um, science uh, results. And as we said, the rocket seeds um, from one of the, the programs, the education programs, came back down with Scott Kelly. Um, so how long do you think it takes them to pack the spacecraft in order to get back down to Earth? I know it takes me a while to get packed to go on holiday if I'm, you know, go away for a week with my car it takes quite a long time so how do you long do you think it takes them to pack up their Soyuz spacecraft so answers in the box again Christine's here how long do you think Christine <coughs> about two days two days yeah Christine thinks a couple of days to get all that packed yeah Catherine about 10 hours mayors about a week yeah so we've got a, a variety of different answers here um, and it is actually a very complex thing. Um, so they have to make sure that the weight is very, very, very well balanced. They don't want to have things, something that's really, really big on one side. They want to make sure that everything is well balanced all around the spacecraft. So Christine, you were right on the money. It takes them about two days in order to pack the spacecraft in order to leave the space station. So it, it's going to be something they have to pay a lot of attention to when they're getting ready to go. So by the Friday, um, when Tim and the others get ready to go, they will have begun packing uh, the spacecraft. So there'll be, as I said, a mixture of results from science experiments. And, you know, we've been talking about previously all these kinds of blood and urine samples they take. That often gets returned uh, with the Soyuz as well. So there's lots and lots of really important things that come back down with them in the spacecraft. And um, so that's something we'll need to pay a lot of attention to. So um, this is, again, quite a, a close thing, um, kind of sitting next to each other. Um, but three and a half hours isn't too long to spend cooped up like that. And what they have to look forward to once they have jettisoned uh, their engines and things is this lovely descent through the atmosphere. And as I said, they, they fire the engines to slow them down. But once they get into the atmosphere, they don't have that capability. And instead, they have parachutes. So these parachutes will fire um, probably 15 minutes before landing, and this will slow them down quite dramatically. So you can see the picture there looks absolutely beautiful. Um, and do you think it's a nice calm descent? What do you think, Amy, Christine? Do you think it's something that'd be quite a gentle experience? Once the parachute's open, yeah. Once the parachute's <laughs> open, yes, <laughs> it's probably quite a reassuring thing <laughs> yeah. to actually have happen. Um, but you're still actually going quite fast. <laughs> yeah, and it, absolutely. A lot of it's going to depend on wind patterns as well. You might get buffed about a little bit, but you're coming in quite fast. And the shape of the spacecraft as well has been designed uh, to help them slow down, but also there's a heat shield on the bottom to help protect them from the, the heat that builds up as they come down through the atmosphere quite quickly. Um, so when they get really close to the ground, one thing that happens is this. So you've got the parachute you can see there, but underneath the spacecraft, they have engines that fire very quickly, only a few metres uh, when only a few metres above the ground, and that's really to slow the spacecraft down right before they land. Now the area they're landing in is in Kazakhstan. That's where all of the spacecraft return back to. Um, and the, the landing here, however, is still quite yeah, it's it's coming down with a bang definitely, and it's spoken about as being the equivalent of being in a, a 40 mile an hour car crash okay so it's that kind of energy that kind of impact you're going to feel you do come back down with quite a big thump um so that is something that's you know quite a jarring experience especially being used to you know flying around in weightlessness for six months previously or one year if you're scott kelly um, so they land back down in kazakhstan and there's usually a zone of about 30 kilometers um, that they predict that the spacecraft is going to land in. And when they land, um, they are met by their crews um, that are going to pull them out of the spacecraft itself. Now, as we know, there's lots of ex um, exercise that gets taken on, on the space station uh, to keep them fit enough so that when they get back to Earth, they can walk and they should be able to get themselves out of the spacecraft um, under their own steam. But um, there's lots of Russian tradition that maybe some of you have discovered uh, whilst you've been doing some of this research and the Russians uh, want to make sure that they are carried 
out and looked after. And we can see um, Maid Herr Chris Hadfield there on the left hand side um, being looked after once he's come out of their spacecraft. So there's lots of ways in which they try and protect the astronauts when they come back into land. And that includes having a mode seat for them as well, because as I said, that kind of experience of landing um, at that speed is, is quite difficult. So they, they mold a seat to them as well to try and give them as much comfort as possible. And the orientation at which they sit um, trying to lessen the kind of force through their body as well to, to make it a, a lot more comfortable for them uh, when they land. So those are the main things they're going to go through. It's taking about three and a half hours um, once they leave uh, the space station itself, which is quite a quick return to Earth. And that also is useful in case of any emergencies on the space station as well. If something were to go wrong, the astronauts can get in their spacecraft quite quickly and, and return to Earth. That's one of the benefits of having the International Space Station. So has anyone got any questions they want to ask me just now about returning to Earth? Um, it's probably more likely going to be covered in, in terms of TV coverage. Um, again, maybe like at the BBC Stargazing Live type broadcast. Um, I'm sure BBC news outlets will be broadcasting live as well. There's also things like NASA TV. Um, you can watch all these things live online as well. And I'm sure with interest in Tim, there will be um, some live broadcasts and things that you can play back uh, the, the following week with your pupils in class. Um, Tim's probably not going to be available immediately afterwards. He's not going to be doing any kind of press result, uh, press conferences and things. Um, they all get taken together. The, th the two cosmonauts and the astronaut will get taken together to a location that they will do a brief um, kind of press conference. And then each of the cosmonauts and astronauts will go off to a different place. So Tim will return to Germany um, immediately after he gets back to Earth. So he'll fly back to there. That's where he's going to start his rehabilitation and recuperation period um, is back in Germany. Um, so, okay, if there are no questions for me at the moment, I'm going to pass back over to um, Amy and she's, we're now going to start on a section uh, looking at what you've all been up to. Um, so some of you who are here today, you might have sent us in a news report, which we featured on our blog. Um, and then we're going to chat to Christine shortly and get a sense of what she's been up to in her school. And also we'll be asking you some more questions about what you've been working on. But in the meantime, here's Amy to tell us about some of the school work. All right, hi again. So thank you to everybody who sent us blog posts over the past few months. Like we really do enjoy receiving them, finding out what you've done, and especially the pictures, like having the kids just having an absolute whale of a time is really fantastic to see. Um, so I'm just going to go through some of the ones that we've had on our blog. So if we start with number one. So this is Mac Mary Primary School, and their P5, P6 class started learning about the solar system. Um, and they used real fruit to create a scale model of the planets to help them understand the relative sizes of the planets to each other. So they had Mercury as a peppercorn, Venus and Earth as cherry tomatoes, uh, Mars as a blueberry, Jupiter's watermelon, Saturn's a grapefruit, Uranus is an apple and Neptune's a lime. Um, so I really like this idea, just give a very good visual image of the scales. Um, so uh, hopefully you can work out what the title of the post refers to. My very excited monkey just sat underneath noodles. Because we have to update it for, you know, this minus Pluto era that we're now in. So St. John's Primary were investigating space weather with Laura, actually, over here. So in November, Laura visited Mrs. Gil Martin's P5 and P6 class um, over in Port Glasgow. So they spent the afternoon talking about the, what was the upcoming mission at that point um, and learned where the Aurora Borealis or the Northern Lights came from. Um, so they began by reminding themselves how the Earth moves in relation to the sun to give days and years. And then everybody had the choice to either draw the Earth or the sun and then pull them in, which is always the best bit. Mm -hmm. So once they had their drawings ready, the topic moved on to talking about forces. Um, so they had to go with magnets, using them to experience the forces of push and pull that the magnets generate, um, and then related this to the Earth's and Sun's magnetic fields. Um, so they know or they learned that the Earth's magnetic field protects us from particles in space that are thrown out by the Sun's magnetic field. Um, and then once they'd learned this, each pupil then added the magnetic field to their Earth or Sun drawing. And then next they found out that when the Sun's magnetic field combines with very energetic particles, they create a solar wind or a coronal mass ejection, also known as a solar flare. And this is what gets blasted out towards the Earth. Now, if it reaches us, Earth's magnetic field pushes the particles to add the north or the south pole. And when these particles hit the particles in our atmosphere, they emit light. And this is what creates our northern lights. So it's actually quite a simple process if you think about it. 
Um, so the pupils then finished off their activity by adding either a coronal mass ejection if they draw drawn the sun or the aurora if they had drawn the earth to make these fantastic pictures that you can see in the bottom there. So St John's Primary School had a class visit from us here at the Royal Observatory by my colleagues Will and Russell. Um, so I'll actually read this one out because um, this blog post was written by some of the children themselves, so I think it always deserves some recognition if they've made the effort to do it. Um, so they had a visit from the ROE. The first thing we did was go into a big dome called the Star Lab, which you can see in the picture there. We all sat down and watched our PowerPoint about the ISS. After that, the lights dimmed and the stars started to appear, and Russell told us a story to go with the groups of stars he pointed out with his laser pen. After that, we went up to our classroom and Russell taught us how to build paper rockets in a group and then we went outside to launch them with a tube, a bottle and our rockets. Some of them went flying through the air at great speeds. They can be a little bit lethal. <laughs> After launching our rockets, we went to the gym hall to do some space training and there were four stations. A steady hand test, marshmallow syringe, agility and tricky jigsaw. Our favourite station was the tricky jigsaw because we had to put on astronaut gloves and try to solve the jigsaw. It was very tricky. Overall, it was a very fun day. We learned lots of new facts about space and the challenges Tim Peek will be facing very soon. So that's by Calvin, Irfan and Lauren in the P6A class. So Eaglesham Primary School um, did the scale of the solar system. So at the start of this new school year, um, P7 took out inflatable planets to the playground to work out how far each planet is placed from the sun. So using the distance between the Earth and the Sun as one astronomical unit, which it is in reality, um, they used that as a starting point and calculated if the Earth is one AU, then they multiply that by 10 to do 10 steps. So the guy holding Earth would take 10 steps away from the Sun and be placed there. So they did that the same for every planet, rounding up and down where needs be. So for Mercury, it was four steps away, Venus eight, Earth 10, as I said. Mars 15, Jupiter 52, Saturn 95, Uranus 192 and Neptune 301 steps away. Um, so obviously it showed the children very clearly sort of the scale, scale of the solar system, how far away the planets are from the sun. And then they also got the children to do their orbits around the sun so you can see how long it takes, for example, the gas giants to orbit compared to the rocky inner planets. So Carol's side primary seemed to cram a lot into their learning, which is fantastic. Um, so again, their P7 class have, have been the ones who've been enjoying all these activities recently. Um, so they've been enjoying learning what it takes to be an astronaut um, and spent some time doing some of the exercises needed to increase fitness and agility during their PE lessons. They also discovered how difficult it is to carry out everyday jobs in space with their space gloves. So they put on fit gloves and tried to do basic things like unlock padlocks, write down things um, and pick objects up. And obviously this is very much trickier in this sort of situation. They also then looked at space food and how it's made and watched some videos of astronauts trying to have their dinners up there. As you can imagine, the chaos that ensues with that, with fruit floating around. Um, and then from then, they actually went one step further and learned some Russian. So they looked at the Russian alphabet and learned how to write their names in the Russian language um, and discovered that Tim Peake must have had a really hard job trying to get his Russian up to scratch to be able to work on the ISS. They all got together to watch the launch, which is fantastic. And then we'll be able to talk, we're able to talk about the spacewalk as well, albeit they're a bit disappointed that it finished early. Um, so they know a lot about the ISS now. And they studied how far away it is and what's on board. And they said that they used a globe, a tennis ball and some string to show the planets in relation to the station, just to show where the station is within the solar system, which is great. So Sir East Stock Primary School in the Isle of Harris is actually where my colleague Will is now on doing their visit, which is brilliant. Um, so they sent me loads of absolutely fantastic blog posts, I think one for every activity with brilliant pictures, all written by their kids. Um, so I just had to pick a selection here because I would have put all of them, we would have been here for four hours. Um, but there are a couple more on the, the blog on the ROE website that you can look up. So this first one, the ISS challenge, again, is written by one of their children, Neil Morrison, so I'll read that out for you. So this term, Anna, Hannah, Nathan and I started to build our own ISS, and as the building progressed, we all had a lot of fun. It's one metre by one metre and has most of the parts of the real ISS, and now it's hanging on our display wall. We are really happy with the result and are happy to see it on the wall. We faced a lot of challenges along the way, but we all worked together as a team to work through it. 
and I love that last sentence. It really embodies the whole spirit, you know, of the, this project and what Tim must be doing about the ISS. Everything involves teamwork and working together to push through a problem. So another one that they did was a space to design challenge, and I absolutely love this one. Um, so this one was written by Finn Globe in P5. So he said, we designed our own spacesuits and our spacesuits had to have some main features. They needed to be mainly white to reflect heat and have boots that are built into the suits. They had to have space gloves attached to a helmet, not attached to a helmet, attached, <laughs> and a helmet that was also part of the full suit with a neck seal in the helmet. Finally, we needed a radio and a microphone to communicate. I hope you like our designs. And I absolutely love these. Again, there was loads more of the kids dressed like this. And I think this would be a great idea for the visitors to send to having all the staff <laughs> dressed as astronauts on the wall. I'm going to suggest that at the next meeting, I think. And there we go. Switch back over to Laura to talk with Christine. Thanks. Okay, so Chris and I are just going to get settled here and get started and have a little conversation. Um, what would be really great is if you could all have a think at the moment about what has been your favourite activity so far or, or event that's happened as part of the project in your school. And if you'd like to give us a really kind of brief summary um, of that in the box below. So have a think about that and start um, giving us some comments. That'd be great. Um, so Christine and I are going to have um, a chat through things. Um, also, we'd love it if you had any questions for Christine as well. Yep, I'm sure yep. she'd be delighted. Mm -hmm. So come on over, Christine. Okay. Hi. So I'm um, really delighted that Christine is able to join us today. Um, and I've been into business school. It's yeah, fantastic yep. school. So can you mm -hmm. just tell us, come in a little bit closer. Okay. Yep. Mm -hmm. Stay close. And yep. um, tell us a little bit more about your school okay. and how you get involved in the project. Okay. Well, I'm the, I've got a primary three, four class. And when I got involved in the term peak experience, my children were six and seven year old, which people thought a wee bit too young, but not at all not at all so I'll really come from that angle get them young get them very very young and so much so within this uh, class of um, primary three four in a Hamilton um, area called Southern Hill Edel Road to get the children to calm down I don't have to say be quiet or ring a bell we do Tim Peak total silence they are enthused about Tim Peak and it's been absolutely fabulous that's a wee bit about myself that's great so, um, Christine has done lots and lots of different bits of work, so I know there's some things you want to share with us today. Yep. Um, but really, kind of first of all, can you come back across? Sorry, yep. <laughs> Keep your lovely face in view. <laughs> um, and just say, well, um, what were your first thoughts then when you first got involved with the project to get right. started? Okay. Uh, until then, I obviously had no concept of space. I was in eco schools, green flags, so I was more concerned about flowers and beasts. Space has no interest for me whatsoever. And from meeting Laura, being looking at the media, being involved in CPD, totally, totally enthused. And I think it's a fantastic place to do all sorts of skills and attitudes and learning with children of all ages, even if they're six. That's great. Yeah, really great to have um, such younger people yeah. involved. Yeah. I think, like you say, getting them young is very, very useful. Okay, so um, when you got back to class, so after you'd been to the CPD yep. session and things, mm -hmm. what were the kind of first things that you started to do to get going? Okay, we went back to class. I didn't go straight to my own class. I started to get through school assembly, and I tried mm -hmm. to get as many of us involved as we can. So I enthused the full school about Tim Peak. Every class watched the mission, watched the blast off. Even the staff spoke about the blast off. So I tried to get as much involved within the school. Children periodically from all classes brought me sports spacecrafts, all sorts of models. It was tremendous. The whole school seemed to get involved. And even today, when I have whole school assemblies, I like to give them an update on various things that we've been learning, the children speak. We like to give the whole school, specifically in my own class, I actually made use of something called a space diary, produced by the ESA. Fantastic. And that actually takes you through an astronaut and a space mission with all sorts of links, with webcams and so on. So that was a fantastic starting point. I've been going to, I then got the children to say what do they want to know, what do they know about space, and let's do some writing of letters, give letters a purpose. We wrote to many, many people. We wrote to the Met office and asked about weather and space. We wrote to an organisation called STARS, S-T-A-R-S. We wrote to them. We applied for a visit to Glasgow Science Centre. We actually um, 
contacted a, a Russian lady from Hamilton and asked her to come up and help. We looked at media coverage. We covered everything we covered. We went through the media to encourage people from the local community to come in and give us a hand. So first of all, we put the feelers out. We wanted to know certain things and we wanted to use a local community and obviously letter writing skills, make it really purposeful. Because at that point, my children, all they could speak about was aliens and, you know, all the space games. So I had to bring it back to air. That was a very good starting point. That is great. So um, did you have like a regular time each week that you would review things or you just... Kind Not of... at all. If, for example, I love the newspapers and there's something about space, a Tim Peake came on the newspaper, I brought it in. The children could start a morning telling me what they had seen in the news that night. We watched the mission. It depended on the letters back from people. It depended on worked through the diary and it was possibly every single day and still had been. That's how enthusiastic we are about it. Oh, that's fantastic. Um, so what do you think the impact then has been on your pupils? What do you think they've gotten from it? Absolutely fantastic. You know, the amount of skills, the attitudes, the knowledge. You know, it's not all about remembering the distance from Earth to the Moon or, or how long it takes you to run from like here to the atmosphere. That's important and that's fun. But the attitudes, they're enthused, they are loving it. We had somebody yesterday from um, STARS who's an astrobiologist and we even went beyond the moon, we were way by Tim Peake, we've gone by him. <laughs> we're actually talking about Mars exploration and we were aghast to find out this gentleman from STARS could tell us about Mars simulations. So we've actually gone beyond that. It's just fantastic, the knowledge, the attitudes, the skills. It's a possible workplace of the future. At the minute, we've, uh, we've written to a Glasgow workspace who are developing satellites and we're trying to link up with them. How could we as children, future workplace, be working and using satellites? We've got BT in. They've told us about our phone satellites. So opening up the workplace to my boys and girls as well. And I think it's great that you're doing that at such a young age as well. And like you said, the emphasis on your community. Very much well. so. Very, it's... it's, it's, it's approachable, it's easy, it's manageable, it's not something away up in space. You've got a BT engineer down the road, your dad might be a BT engineer, yeah. you've got a local science department down the road, you know, use them, make it purposeful. Yeah, I guess it's a case of you don't ask, you don't get, which That's I think you're showing the, the success true. of That's what true. happens when you do yeah. ask, because yeah. um, yeah. you've had such a great response. From young children, they did the speed work and I maybe loaded a gun, but they actually fired it. <laughs> Excellent. And I think you've highlighted lots of kind of cross-curricular aspects have. You know, as it's, well. You know, it's, it's fantastic. You know, it's not just like space, space up there, so to speak. For example, uh, bringing in the maths, okay, they're only six and seven, but we actually ran around the primary school to simulate the distance from Hamilton, our school, to the International Space Station. We actually challenged a primary seven child, uh, class from Lanark uh, up the road. Now, they each... <laughs> travelled X amount of kilometres. We didn't. As a class, we divided the distance in between 23. Nobody told us that we had to we had to do it individually. So we actually we actually won there. You're talking about metres, you know, talking about pacing out in metres and so on distance. Literacy, I mean the application to be a space spacecraft and a spacecraft driver. Fantastic. Uh, the adventures of space. But yesterday I, I even brought in a, an example of a film from many moons ago as a poster. You know, we actually thought, right, OK, we've gone beyond the moon. What's happening now? There's an excellent particle on its way to Mars. There's a, there's a module in Mars. You know, what's, what's going on? So we were there yesterday, and within the stories given back, they were mentioning Tim Peake, they were mentioning international space stations, they were mentioning the fact that uh, one of them even took him a cup of tea up because the water wasn't that good. We need children of seven, but they can understand that concept and make light of it. We had a Russian in, and Nadia actually told us how to say space in Russian, how to say rocket in Russian, like cosmonaut. Spoke about the early Roman uh, space pioneers from Russia and told us some Russian language. Nadia works in the local gym down the road. You know, that, that made it so, so, so lifelike for us. Another super link was Scots. There is a story called We Charlie. And we Shirley is a, cause, as a, not a comet who's given all sorts of stushies and stramashes up in space. And there's reference to comets, asteroids, the big burning planet called, you know, this kind of thing. They want, they want me all the rings around about it. <laughs> Fabulous. So you can bring in Scots plus uh, space as well. We had uh, science, oh my lord, there's, there's graffiti, there's forces. 
a neighbour from the Met office came in and spoke about science weather. I had no idea. He says within the last 10 years, the weather up in space has made such an impact on my world. Climate change and so on. Put up clips that you see on the news. The children were fascinated that the space weather is actually... And yesterday, the, the band from Stars came in and someone commented them, do you know, Adam, someone sits and watches the sun for 24 hours? Because you see these colonial mass injections, they're so important. And Stephen jumped back, seven, eight-year-olds, because they, they actually saw and they heard it in operation. We've done the rocket science seats. They've come today. This is what it looks like. Whole step the step gauge, the red packet and the blue packet. So we're, we're on that already. That's, that's the growing. Solar systems and so on. Uh, technology, NASA links, making PowerPoints, Twitter links and so on. Arts and crafts. Here's a wee bit of cooking for you as well. Uh, we made a moon base. We made a moon base with um, salt, water and flour. Baked it. That is a moon base. That gives you, popped your fingers in it. I mean, they're only primary three, four, but they had a ready-made moon, moon base. Using Oreos, we actually ate them and made the faces of the moon. Again, it made it so lifelike. We could then look at that night and tell them if it was the first bite or the second bite. But, you know, it, it meant something to them. We um, had a, a sunny digestive biscuit in the middle with a set of different coloured m &Ms coming from it with the icing sugar rings going round about. Again, if you can eat it, you'll remember it. And, and they, they have, they have. And just, I haven't, we haven't finished yet. You know, we're desperate for time to come down and it's just, it's been fabulous, fabulous. And as I say, this space diary from the ESA has certainly keeps you on track and stops you going too far off. So I would say that um, we've got copies of that at the Royal Observatory. So if you haven't had the Space Society and you'd like the opportunity to um, have a go through it, then we can arrange to get you some uh, a class set for those because I think we've got plenty, haven't we, Amy? Um, so yeah, we, we have a chat bit more about that when we get into the resources section. But yeah, it just sounds uh, great, um, all the different things that you've managed to, yep. to, to get involved yep. with. Young, young children, you know, young children, even primary one and primary two are coming with spacecrafts and space modules to me as well because they think it's fabulous too. So how do you see this kind of continuing in the future and kind of how the impact on teaching space? Oh, think? very, very, very much so. I mean, my children can find it in media, can find it in television, can come back and talk to me about it. You know, what they know about space and the sun and the moon, we've even brought it into the climate change. You know, we're very much an eco-school as well. If we don't live like Wally, you know, if we don't look after our world, mm -hmm. space isn't a pretend anymore. Space is a possibility and a necessity. Within 30 years, some of my pupils will possibly be in space. And according to Adam from the stars, could be on the road to Mars. That made them think. That definitely made them think. You know, how, how big a dream could that be? Something to look forward to. I don't think we'll believe in space for much longer. You know, it's, we'll never let it go. It's fabulous, and myself included. That's great. Um, I think uh, Tracy was asking you what you did with the M&Ms. She missed your description. Right, OK. You have to get a digestive biscuit and put it in the centre. Uh, your planets, various colours, a pack, pack of mixed mixed names, pull out your colours that are similar to Saturn and Jupiter and so on, work out obviously the distance, not much the distance, just the kind of relationship from the sun from each planet, get a piping bag of icing sugar, okay, so you've got the, the digestive biscuit in the middle, you've got your first planet which is like Mars, Mars, that's the red one, have a red M&M &M, and just put a white icing sugar circle round about it to signify an orbit, get your next planet, sit it on, no, doesn't matter if the distance is scaled or not, put an icing sugar ring. Now, but that, young children can see the rings, they can see the orbits, they can see distance, they can see how big the sun is. It's a monster biscuit in comparison with the m names plus they get to eat it, and if they eat it, they remember. <laughs> Especially it sounds like it's a sweet thing as well. True. That's true. That's great. Okay, so um, does anyone have any questions they want to ask uh, Christine at the moment about how um, she's approached things? I think we're also interested in hearing about other ways that you've engaged um, with mm -hmm. your community. Which, I could just um, maybe sort of pick up yeah. on that picture, oh, yeah, the picture there. Yeah. You know, that was an actually simulating a meteoroid landing in space because I've got a thing about meteoroids and asteroids and when a meteor becomes a meteorite. And they, they could tell me that, you know, it's, it's, it's fascinating. So what we did, what we got giant, giant, we've got marbles, we've got giant balls, and we literally dropped them from all sorts of heights, and we looked at the impact, the impact, 
where the hole was deep, we measured the holes and so on. They found that absolutely fascinating. That was flour, flour and marbles, and some of them went home that night and actually made flower baths and actually dropped marbles on them. Again, science in there. It's marvellous. That's great. So I think we've had um, a few people uh, sharing things, haven't we, Amy? Mm -hmm. So, oh, so Kerry, you've already planted your rocket seeds. Oh, right. Thank Excellent. We're really well excited to see what's going to happen with those. Absolutely. And so, Tracy, you've had your school out at the Destination Space at the Science Centre. So, yeah, if you've got a science centre near you, they have uh, various uh, programmes, but Destination Space is the name of um, a show that links to Tim Peake's mission um, and the tissue paper solar system, right? So, you use that to wait, as a way to visualise distance of the planets. Not as tasty as um, in yep. school, I'm sure, tissue paper. And that's great. So it looks like, um, Tracy, in your school, you've been really involved in lots of different age groups as well, which is fantastic. So please just um, share your favourite um, examples. And Elaine, what have we been saying here? Ah, yes. So yeah, the, the stickers for the Pinkipia Diaries. Yeah, so that's really great as well, just to kind of signify how they're progressing um, through. That's excellent. It's fantastic. Okay, so just uh, keep sharing things with us at the moment. That's going to be really great. Um, so Christine's going to still be here with us. Thank you. So if there's questions you want to ask, I will throw them across the Thank part you. as we go. Um, and uh, what we'll do now is we'll probably have a look at some of the resources. Um, so if there are resources that you've been using um, or that you haven't been using yet that you want us to actually um, have a discussion about just now, that is great. Um, so... So, um, oh, yeah. So, I will just get us on to that in a moment. I'm just going to review a couple of things. So, hopefully, this is quite a well used resource. Everyone recognises their Earth Ball. Um, and this is really great for using different scaling activities, um, which um, is really nice in terms of showing the distance to the International Space Station. So, as a test, because we did this in the first session, can you remember, so if this, the Earth's the size of a beach ball, how far away is the space station? So how far above the surface of the beach ball is the space station? That's 400 kilometres in distance, but what is that on the scale of the Earth being the size of a beach ball? Mm, I thought Paul would be in there quite quickly. Anyone else? So hopefully you can use this in class as well, and you can use it to show distance uh, to the moon also. A couple of similar responses. Excellent. Okay, yep, so you're absolutely correct. It's one centimetre um, above the surface is uh, about 400 kilometres. So I remember when I found this out, being totally blown away because I thought astronauts were masses and masses and masses away away from the Earth, but actually they're really close to being. So it's this one centimetre above the surface that Tim is orbiting. I think you can get a sense of the distance um, by some of the photographs that he's been sharing. He's a really active photographer in space, which is great. So I'd recommend having a look at those. Um, I also have, let's try not to knock over our fan, um, this umbrella. So hopefully some of you have been using this. Um, I know that some of you have been doing some observing activities, but obviously with it getting a bit um, Lighter in the nights, which is quite fun. Um, it means less time for observing. So, has anyone been using the constellation umbrella yet? Um, so, on it you can see um, our familiar constellations. You can use it as a way to discuss uh, things like seasons um, and showing the horizon and how um, the actual uh, constellations change um, across the year as well. So, at the moment, um, Orion's going to be disappearing, um, and there'll be other constellations that will start to appear as well. So, it's quite a nice way of doing it. Um, quite sturdy umbrella so if you do really get stuck and it's raining outside I guess you could use that but not really the purpose. So um, there's a few resources we want to highlight today and um, to encourage you to use but as I said if there's anything that you really particularly want us to discuss um, or to go through then please let us know. Oh I like that um, Catherine just made a wee comment about using the umbrella yeah because obviously there's a lot of stories that are associated with the shape of the constellations but I think that's really nice making up um, a Scottish constellation so um, what other ones were there apart from Nessie I think Nessie is quite a good one to go for um, I also really like the connections back to um, Scots language as well so I'll make sure um, yes. we get a link to that and we'll share that with you afterwards um, as well um, but on this slide I have um, three different resources that I'm going to discuss um, this afternoon. So the first one is the Rosetta resource. Has anyone here used the Rosetta resource so far? So if you just drop a line in the box to let me know whether or not you've used it yet. 
So the Rosetta mission um, is a European Space Agency mission, and um, it's currently um, at a comet called uh, 67P. I'm not even going to try and go for the really long pronunciation, um, but 67P is the comet, um, and it looks a little bit like a duck. I have a little um, 3D model that my friend printed for me, um, and it yeah, from a distance, it looks like a duck that you might have floating in your bath, for example. But this comet is made of dust and of ice, and it travels around the sun, and at the moment it's heading in towards our sun. And as it heads towards our sun, it starts to heat up, and some of these particles uh, start to come off it, and it has a little bit of a boom behind it. Um, and there have been opportunities to actually see comets in the night nice sky, um, very rare opportunities that only happens um, every so often, um, but you often see um, a bright object in the sky with this tail behind. And that's these particles that have been melted by the sun creating this tail. Now, we are really interested in comets for various reasons, um, but one of them is to do with the origin of water. Now, Earth is a very, very special planet, as we are all very aware of, um, but we have liquid water and we have quite a lot of it. Um, and we don't really know where it came from and how it came to be here. So one of the things we're interested in is the type of water that's on the comets um, that are in our solar system. There are a very, very large number of them. So the European Space Agency designed a mission, which launched over 10 years ago, to travel to this comet to then land on the surface and take some measurements. So there's one uh, part of the comet, the part of the mission, which is called um, Rosetta. Um, which is the spacecraft which is going traveling around the comet itself and the second part was a lander called Philae um, and I would say that in terms of, um, kind of education program from the European Space Agency this has been one of their, their best um, and there's some really suitable stuff even for really young pupils I would say and thinking about Christine's class um, they have some really great animations using their uh, a mascot called Paxi uh, talking about the mission. So you can find that on the ESA website and I'll make sure we share a link to that afterwards. So they were interested in finding a bit more about what the comet is made from. So that's why they sent it there. And okay, and that's uh, Paul commenting that they've used it with a primary seven class. So this was produced um, by ESRO, so European Space Education Resource Office, and if you actually have a look on um, a web link box just on the bottom left hand corner, and if you go and click on to, I think it is, is it the second or the third one? If you click on the second link in that box and click browse to, the resource itself should open in a second window so that you can have a look at the PDF. You've got a physical copy of this in your resources box, but if you don't have it to hand, you can have a quick click onto the electronic copy at the moment. And it has a number of different activities. And the way it's arranged is it takes you through the activities, it gives you an idea um, of the age range. So just here um, in the uh, summary, um, it gives you an idea of the age range. So it goes from five up to 11, the different activities. And in the activities themselves, it also tells you how long it's going to take you to actually run them. So some of them are really nice and short, that will fit within a lesson, 45 minutes. Some of them, uh, with a shorter lesson, some of them take a bit longer, maybe one to two or, or three hours as well. And there are a range of different activities, but they are focusing um, around the, the Rosetta mission itself. And I think it's really nice. It's a nice contemporary mission. There's lots of uh, things and, and responses um, being shared from the spacecraft still. Um, so there's a lot of activity still going on. And it's going to get really interesting as the comet gets closer to the sun to see what else happens to it. So at the moment, they've had to move the spacecraft further away from the comet, uh, just in case there's a plume or something explodes off the surface of the comet, we don't want the, the spacecraft to be damaged. Um, but what I find incredible is that the spacecraft has taken so long uh, to get there. So it's been going uh, and travelling much, much longer than you know, your, a lot of your primary children have actually been alive. Um, so that's Rosetta. Rosetta is a lot of fun. Um, and another resource is the Is There Anyone Out There? So that's the third uh, link at the bottom there. So you can click onto that and click Browse To. That will take you to an electronic copy of it. I'll just grab my physical copy. So is there anyone out there? Um, whereas Rosetta is a bit more focused on the space kind of topics um, within the curriculum, um, this has a bit more connection uh, to things like technology and also to chemistry as well and the science um, aspects and materials and things like that. Um, and if you can just drop a line as well, if anyone's used, is there anyone out there? Now, what I would recommend is that a lot of the, the content in here, and particularly some of the meteorite um, things, connects really well to the loan boxes. So if you've had the meteorite loan box or you've got it coming up, 
there might be one or two activities in here that help um, extend the learning um, of your pupils beyond the box. So I saw uh, Paul commenting earlier about um, what was great was that all your pupils got a chance to actually hold the meteorites and get involved with those. Um, also activities in here really help them then understand a bit more about where the meteorites come from and, and what happens to them um, as well. So again, very similar to the Rosetta, um, there's uh, an outline of all the different uh, activities and how long they take to actually uh, run themselves as well. Um, so I really enjoy running these in classrooms and they are really quite um, active things uh, to run as well. I would say this one, this resource needs a bit more equipment um, than the Rosetta one necessarily, um, but these are really straightforward things you should be able to get hold of. And if not, um, as Christine was mentioning, you've got your local science uh, secondary school uh, departments that you can really get involved with um, as well. I'm sure they'd be very, very happy to help. Um, but a lot of this is your pupils taking on the role uh, um, of, present, of scientists, basically, and really doing lots of investigations themselves. And the context is about life. I think that's something that you know a lot of young people are really quite interested in as they think about aliens and do aliens exist are there little green men um, and this is actually starting to boil down start to think about the concepts of life um, so for example one of the activities in here really starts to think about well what is life what is li what are um, items are living and non-living for example so really starting to look out look at that kind of activity um, so one of my favorite ones is actually to do with soil samples so there's recipes in the book um, and you can make up mock soil samples uh, from Mars. So here's my Martian soil sample. And one activity um, gives each group of people, um, so maybe working in groups of four, they're given three different samples, and there's a set of scientific experiments you have to do on each sample um, to test. And they have to then decide which of them is actually uh, from Mars. So the test includes, um, and they're guided along uh, through this by the activity, by the resource, and that's kind of looking at the color, Obviously, things on Mars are what colour? Red, yes, absolutely. Um, and there's also guidance as to what they kind of feel like, what they look like, what size the particles are. So they just start, first of all, by looking at the, pack, the samples themselves, what do they look like, and recording their thoughts. So there's three samples they have to record that with. Um, one of the other things that you find is there's salt in a lot of samples um, when uh, we're, we're um, getting those from Mars. So how would you test a sample for salt? How could you do that? Can you do this? So they're given three different uh, samples. You could taste it, but I wouldn't encourage uh, <laughs> people to stick their fingers in and have a, a wee lick. That would not be recommended. Um, but other things that you can do is you could take um, a little bit of um, a sample of each, mix it with water, and then you could, and I'm going to wait and see if Paul finishes, yeah, dissolve and evaporate. Absolutely, yeah. So you can dissolve a little bit of the sample in some water and then you can evaporate that off. Um, so that's one way of doing it. And then you should be able to see um, salt rings um, if, if they're present or not. Um, and one of the other things is looking at actually if um, the particle sizes uh, let water pass through quickly and also the test for acidity as well. But a lot of it is actually to do with team working, um, gathering information, gathering data and decision making as well. So it's not just a case of the sample which has the most ticks is the one that's from Mars. It's actually thinking about the information they're given about the soil samples themselves. And they are given some guidance as to what Mars soil samples usually contain. It's about dealing with that information. So this is more suitable in terms of more kind of second level um, rather than younger pupils um, that would be doing things. Um, but it is really quite a fun uh, hands-on activity and that's just one of the things to get started with. Um, the other one does involve, just like Christine was shown us, using uh, different objects and dropping that into sand um, or into flour. And you can layer things up like sand and uh, flour and cocoa even. So when you drop objects in, you get ejecta packs. Um, around the outside um, and there's various different objects that you can drop. Um, I drop things like stones and bouncy balls. Marbles is one of my favourite ones as well, Christine, to drop. Um, and, but also what I like about um, the Is There Anyone Out There kit is that it gives you um, a little recommended way of actually making a, a measurement of how deep the craters are. So again, it's about uh, collecting data, data analysis, and you can even draw graphs um, and writing tables to, to put their results together. So there's lots of different ways in which they can collect data um, and actually start to analyse it. And um, so really thinking a bit more about scientific method and inquiry and things like that. So I think that's a really nice way. Um, and it, all in the context of looking at Mars, is there life on Mars and taking on the role of scientists? Um, and again, as I said, a lot to do with team working as well.
So that's a fun one to look at also. So um, the third area I want to mention um, is something called the Space to Earth Challenge. Now, that's your top web link on the left-hand side if you want to click onto that. So Christine mentioned that they had a little challenge between her school and St Mary's in Larrick, it was, um, to cover the distance from Earth to space. And that distance is uh, actually uh, 100 kilometres to space, but the space station is 400 kilometres. Um, and the Space Earth Challenge is a way in which you can get involved um, with covering that distance. And that encourages you to run, cycle, swim or walk um, the distance to space. Now, I know that some people can get involved in the Daily Mile, which started out of St Minions in Stirling. Um, so there's a lot of emphasis thinking of, uh, now thinking about regular exercise and how you put that into your day. I know St Minions Lanark were doing stuff um, on terms of uh, trying to really build that into their school day as well. Um, so there's, this is also a kind of nice way of bringing in physical activity in the context of space. And this is different perhaps to the Mission X activities that some of you might have done before as well. Um, and this is just really thinking about distance challenge. Um, so there's schools that all over the country have signed up with this challenge and they are recording the distances covered. And this could be really quite a nice one if you've got things like sports days uh, coming up um, in the next summer term. If you want to still keep the space theme going and uh, maybe keep a total of what distances have been covered by all the different uh, races that you're running. Um, and also this little math challenge as well to kind of work out all the different uh, distances that people have covered. Um, so on the, the site itself, you'll see there's um, lots of different resources there. And this is an electronic resource. So this is linked to Ten Peaks Mission, but this isn't something that would have been in your box. So this might be you coming um, up against this for the first time. Um, but we'd really encourage you to have a look at that. Um, there are some science activities um, associated with this. Um, and some that I really enjoy are to do with horses. And I'll just grab a little prop behind me. So um, one of the things that we consider in terms of the Space to Earth Challenge is actually training. And there's lots of different things that Tim has to do and uh, had to do in order to prepare to go into space. And one of the ways that you really have to think about is what the effect of weightlessness is. So how, does, how did Tim and how do other astronauts prepare for going into space in terms of weightlessness? Any ideas of how they actually do that? Because obviously we're pulled down uh, on the surface by gravity. Um, and it's really something that we have to simulate. Um, the Apollo astronauts um, did some kind of training against this. The Gemini astronauts, very early astronauts, didn't. And when the first early astronauts went into um, space, they found that actually it was really quite difficult to do some manoeuvres. They weren't really prepared for the differences um, of how they, how they moved around in space. And also, if you think about how you open a door, you actually use your body weight and you know, use that as a lever to try and open a door. So there's lots of different activities that you take for granted here on Earth that you can't actually do easily while you're in space. So, OK, right, we've got a couple of suggestions. Yeah, time underwater. Yeah, absolutely. Astronauts often will be uh, very keen divers and then they'll spend a lot of time in the pool in their space suits training because water, absolutely, they will go for that as a kind of experience of weightlessness. And yes, um, Paul's also mentioned the vomit comet. Um, I think I'd quite like to go in the vomit comet. It's one of these aeroplanes that goes up really, really steeply and then it drops back down again. And as it drops back down, you experience weightlessness very, very briefly inside, about 30 seconds at a time. And you experience this, this feeling of weightlessness as you fall in the aeroplane, all under control, of course. And this can be repeated over and over and over again. There's a really, really great um, music video, if anyone's um, a fan of uh, it's OK Go. Um, they did uh, a music video entirely um, on the vomit comet. I don't think there was any vomit though, thankfully. Um, but it's a really, really great thing to watch uh, with your pupils and they demonstrate and show um, weightlessness um, in action um, and lots of little fun things lying around. But yes, the main thing is underwater training. Um, but also it kind of introduces concepts to do with forces. Balancing forces is really important because Tim can't just jump into the pool and just expect that everything's OK. They have to actually weight him down um, and they have to get that balance right. So this, there's some resources that introduce people's concepts of buoyancy. So we're starting to think about that um, and also balance forces as well. And one of the things, one of the challenges is actually to um, weight down a bottle cap so that it actually floats in the middle of a glass. So I've had a go at this. Um, and I'm doing not too badly, but you add little bits of blue tack and the aim is to get your uh, bottle cap to float right in the middle. So it's all about balancing forces. And um, so it's quite a fun little challenge. It can get a bit messy, but at least it's water and the water evaporates. So that's handy. Um, so that's a really quite nice challenge. Um, there's lots of uh, nice prizes and things that you can get involved with um, 
by signing up to the Space Earth Challenge as well. So um, what I'd like now, could you write down for me what your favourite resource has been so far? So you said a little bit about some of the activities that you've done in class, the work with the community, we've heard some stuff from Christine about all the great um, people she's had in to contribute. We've talked about a couple of resources there, but what is your favourite resource being? I see Paul mentions the ISS Education Kit. Um, which I have here. So hopefully some of you recognise that and that takes you through lots of different aspects of going into space um, and this is actually I would say my favourite um, resource. It's really comprehensive but also really cross-curricular as well and um, if you're interested in the Russian aspect this gives you a really great introduction um, to Russian and writing names um, in Russian as well. Um, yep, yeah, Catherine, that's great. I'm glad to hear. I think ISS Kit does cover a lot of different things so that's one you've used the most. Fantastic. Any others you want to share? What was your favourite, Christine? The diary. Yep, still with the diary. Yep, so, uh, my... so it's probably a good opportunity to say a bit more about the diary. Um, so the diary was written in part by Lucy Hawking, who is Stephen Hawking's daughter, and together they've previously written um, a series of books um, involving a character called George, and it's all about teaching astrophysics to eight-year-olds, which I'm a big fan of, and it's great to hear um, even seven-year-olds talking about coronal mass ejections on a regular basis. Um, but in the of Space Diary, they're taking Tim as a character and helping work with him uh, through the actual uh, mission. And yes, you can still get copies of the diaries. If you drop us a line, um, we can sort out uh, copies for you. We've got some of the observatory. Um, and the activities in the diary, so there's a diary that people will have as individuals. You get teacher notes as well. So there's a website that gives you the supporting notes uh, to go along with it. Um, so to begin with, there's our astronaut workout as well. And actually, I think you've all been sitting around far too much. I know I can't see you, but I'm fairly sure you're sitting. So I want everyone to get up and the first challenge is to jump for the moon. So how many jumps can you do in 30 seconds? And we're all going to do it here and you're all going to come around. So we're going to time this. Can, one, can um, Gregor, will you time us? I'll shout right. start when Gregor says, and we'll see how many jumps we can do in 30 seconds. And being honest now as well, I like uh, people sometimes like to add five or 10 onto their total level of this. So let's see. So we ready? Oh, thank you. Okay, I'm going to give you a countdown from three. Okay. <laughs> right, three, two, one, go. Go. Like a method. <laughs> it's a long 30 seconds. It's a long 30 seconds. <laughs> okay, it's stop. stop. Okay, right, answers in the box. Oh. Oh, let's see, answers in the box. Right, mine was, um, mine was 75. 75. Oh, 75, press scene two. Amy? 73. 73, oh, we were all quite in unison there. I'm fairly sure, well, hopefully the, uh, the office downstairs was empty, otherwise we, we would have frightened some people. And actually, there's sometimes I've visited um, some schools. I remember I being in one classroom and I could hear all this thumping from the class next door. And I realized the whole class was doing how many jumps we do in 30 seconds. 91, Tracy. That's amazing. <laughs> wow. Oh, it doesn't matter about your downstairs neighbour. I'm sure if you say it's all in the, the name of science, Catherine, um, that they wouldn't mind. Oh, wow. You, okay, we're quite roundly beaten, to be honest. <laughs> so Denise at 87, Dorothy at 94. I feel really, really bad now. Right, we're going to have to practice that one. Um, but yeah, so it's a, a fun little starter activity looking at astronaut workout. So that's one of the things that you can do. Um, there's a few other things as well, but my favourite, I really love the breathe exercise um, because it often you can get quite excited and uh, Christine's mentioned the enthusiasm of some pupils. But this breathe exercise where you sit down and actually just contemplate and calm your mind and take some deep breaths, I think it's really quite um, a good thing. Oh dear, Paul, someone's a bit injured there at the end, so that's a bit unfortunate. Sounds a little bit like an excuse, but we'll see. So um, there's lots of really active um, things to do, but also some quizzes, um, some designs for some uh, space dinner as well. Oh, Kerry, Kerry's beaten us as well. We did really, really badly, by the way. Um, design space suits, 
Um, so there's all sorts of different things, but it takes you through the timeline of Tim's mission. So it does link it in um, with each of the different aspects. And there's some videos and things yeah, as well. Video class, yeah, video super. So there's mm. lots and lots of things to, to bring into that. This, this resource is so... Come on, this resource is so cherished in my classroom that every single visitor that comes in, including the local police, is given one of these diaries. <laughs> they, are, they are cherished. They are absolutely, Mrs. Zeman, can we give a visitor one? So this majority of Hamilton are wandering about at the minute <laughs> on the Space by Diet Super. Excellent. So yeah, as we said, we've got copies at the Royal Observatory, so if you haven't had some, get in touch with us and we can sort out some class sets as well. Um, so I think also it's quite a timely and topical thing to do, um, and I think it works quite best whilst Tim's in space, I think. There's lots of really nice connections, um, so, so that's really good. Um, so um, one of the things um, that I really like to kind of focus on today as well to mention is um, I kind of back to Earth celebration. So um, we've obviously got a lot of schools that are taking part across the country, um, and there's not really going to be a good opportunity for us to get you all together. We know that's not really realistic. Um, but what we'd like to encourage is for you all to perhaps to try and do the same activity around about the same time. And what we would love is if you could do an activity, and it's called so a soft landing. And um, if you have a look at the Rosetta, it's um, activity number four in the Rosetta. And it's, it's maybe something that you've perhaps done in the past or be familiar with. It's actually um, building a lander for an egg and returning that lander safely down to the ground. Um, but the activity takes you through the design process of build and test and thinking about it before you let them loose on raw eggs and make a mess of your classroom. Um, there's also ways that you can um, limit the mess as well. Um, so that would be really linking back to Tim, returning back to Earth. And thinking about how you get safely from the International Space Station uh, back down to the ground. Now there are two other resources that link in with this as well. One, is the, one of them is the Space Diary, which at that time will be the, um, the Return to Earth uh, section. So one of the chapters in here is going to link to that. Um, so the kind of mission finale and, and the bit at the end. So there's content in here that will help with that. And there's also going to the International Space Station uh, Education Kit, uh, so the big folder, uh, section 4.3 called Coming Home, and takes you through a lot of the different aspects I talked about today, um, but there's some further activities um, there as well. So thinking about friction and how the heat is generated when the spacecraft comes back down, um, there's some experiments that you can do um, and things like that. So there's a few different things um, that you can actually start to get involved with. And there's also one activity that I'd be very keen to get in responses to is to prepare, prepare an interview for an astronaut as well. Um, because we're going to be having an event um, that's going to be tied in with the Mission X programme and the Scottish Space School. That's going to be in Glasgow in June. So if some schools are able to join us, that would be fantastic. Um, we're waiting on final details from the Scottish Space School for that. But it's going to be on the 15th of June at Glasgow Science Centre. And we're really hopeful that we'll have a, a national that will be joining us. It won't be Tim Peake, um, but the Scottish Space School normally have a NASA astronaut that will come over and join. So if you did have questions, um, if you did want to work with your pupils and prepare an interview for an astronaut, we'd love to select some questions and ask them on your behalf if you can't come, um, or if some of you can come along on the day itself, um, we'll give you details about how to do that. Um, but by that day, so by June the 15th, we'd love it if you could um, take part in the soft landing activity with your pupils and record the results, take some pictures, um, write some blog entries and share that with us. Um, that'd be um, really great. We'd really love to hear from you um, about that. Um, so that's our kind of main back to Earth celebration. We've still got a few minutes uh, left here. Um, so really what we're interested, if you get any questions you want to ask us about any other resources, if there's anything in your boxes that you still want us to give you a bit more um, guidance about, then that's great. Okay, hi Elaine. Yeah, and um, if you have blog entries, you can email those uh, directly to your space ambassador. So that's either me, myself, or Amy. So whoever corresponds with you most regularly, whoever annoys you most with emails, um, you can send them by uh, email to one of us. Um, we'll send you a link so you can get an idea, a uh, feel of the type of things people have been sending. Um, uh, but that would be really, really great if you could share um, those with us. Um, we're very keen to sh show off really the work that you've been doing. As I said, there's 500 schools across the UK and we really think there's obviously fantastic work going on in Scotland. So it's a case, uh, an, an opportunity for you to show off um, what you've been doing. 
Um, yeah, we can probably arrange for um, yeah, diaries to be brought out to you as well. That's absolutely no problem. Um, and I think just a couple more things to highlight in terms of uh, dates and things. Um, Amy mentioned the uh, marathon on Sunday. That's what I'm looking at. The marathon on Sunday. Um, and also watch out for his colleagues who will be running in Sokol spacesuits. Not real Sokol spacesuits because that would be really uncomfortable, but they are adapted spacesuits and they're going to be trying to set the world record um, for the fastest marathon in a spacesuit. I'm not sure if there's been anyone that's previously run a, ma a marathon in a spacesuit, but um, they're certainly going to try and, and raise the profile of Tim Peake. Um, and if you see some of the marathon coverage, um, as he said, he's running with uh, a video view, um, and hopefully they'll be um, having various uh, re references to him uh, on the day itself. Um, we've also got um, the official uh, celebration from the UK Space Agency. Um, these are two conferences that are going to be held in November. Unfortunately, there's not one in Scotland. The closest one to us is going to be held in York, um, but Tim will be attending these. And schools can apply um, to attend and go along and talk about the work that they've been done and meet other schools um, about what they've been doing. Um, so there's yeah, there's lots of opportunity for you to share your work. But again, the best thing to do so far is you or your pupils write up the work that you've been doing, send it across to us with a picture, we'll get up on the blog and we'll share it with, with other people as well. Um, and also one of the great things is, you know, next year we're going to have a second group of um, primary schools involved with this. And I'm sure they'll all be really interested in the work that you've got to do as well. But the main thing is we really hope that you continue to, to work um, with space as a context. Um, I'm really hopeful that this won't be Tim's last mission. Really fingers crossed everyone that he does get to go into space. Um, again, um, and Tim's work as an astronaut doesn't finish when he lands back down on Earth. There's still lots of rehabilitation for him to go through. Um, there's lots of involvement in science. He'll still support other missions as well. He'll take part in activities um, as uh, Capcom at Mission Control. So he'll be the person on the ground speaking to astronauts on the space station. He'll take his turn at that. There's lots and lots and lots of things that he's still going to get involved in. So Christine, Amy, is there anything you'd like to add before we finish up? Okay, well, I'd just like to say a really big thank you to Alan and to Gregor in the background here who've been looking after us here at CERC. Oh, and uh, I've just been handed this by Alan that less than four hours, 30 minutes will be a world record for those doing the marathon in a spacesuit. So that is a challenge, so watch out for that. Um, but yes, full service here at CERC, fact checking um, <laughs> as well as technical support, much appreciated. Um, and um, we really hope that you've gotten something out of today um, and we're really delighted with all the work that you're obviously putting in. Thank you so much for the time that you've been spending and uh, the work that you've been doing with your pupils. Um, we're really, really enjoying hearing about it. So please keep sharing uh, your stories. My thanks to Amy again from the Observatory and Christine coming all the way over from Alton to join us here at CERC and for sharing um, our experiences. And so, yeah, we look forward to hopefully seeing you in person soon. Um, if not, please just drop us a line if there's anything else that we can help with. Um, it's a project that we all have really enjoyed working on. So thank you very much, everyone. Um, really nice and, uh, to have you join us uh, this afternoon. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye. I just paused my video.